Good morning. Welcome to St. Matthias and St. Luke Church. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. If you don't know our community, do reach out to me. I'd love to connect with you. My email is chris at smslchurch.ca. I have two quick announcements before we begin morning prayer. The first is that today, February 28th, we have our annual general meeting at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if you are a member of our congregation, we invite you to come to that meeting. It's on Zoom. Hopefully you've received the email. If you haven't, email me and I'll make sure that you get all the information. I'll be checking my email this morning. Um, So come to that. We need people to attend so that we can vote on our next year on things like budget and who our elected leaders will be, etc. It's an important meeting. It'll be a quick meeting. Please come if you can. The second announcement is to remind you that this is the season of Lent. We are journeying with Jesus to Jerusalem through this season, transitioning from winter to springtime, from death to life. It's a season of growth in our faith. And what we as a church are trying to do is to read the second half of Mark's gospel so that we reach the end by Easter Sunday. That means starting tomorrow, we're going to be reading Mark 11 together. So all you need to do, you can find it online if you don't have a Bible, look up Mark 11 and try and read it every day this week. It'll take you two, three minutes. Just read it slowly. Note the verses that jump out at you. Quiet yourself and focus on the story. Ask questions. Ask yourself what you learn about God through the text. Um, So Mark 11 this week is what you should be reading. And then the sermon will be on Mark 11 next Sunday. Let's begin our morning prayer. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We begin our time of prayer by coming to God to confess our sins and to be reminded that when we turn to him, we receive his forgiveness through Jesus. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our heavenly father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we've received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. We pray together, Almighty and most merciful Father. We have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. As we confess our sins to God and put our faith in Jesus, It is because of him and his sacrifice on the cross and his glorious resurrection that we can know we are forgiven. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. And for this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last, we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. 
O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. First reading is Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 34. And Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and the crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And in the house the disciples asked him again about the matter, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, and honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, What with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for the sake, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading continues in Mark 10, verses 35 to 52. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. 
but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we join Christians through the ages around the world to confess our faith in the shared words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we remember and commemorate St. Matthias, the apostle who replaced Judas, one of our namesakes at St. Matthias and St. Luke. And as we approach a very difficult chapter of Scripture, Mark 10, I thought perhaps we could pray the collect for St. Matthias Day together. So let's pray. Almighty God, who in the place of Judas chose your faithful servant Matthias to be numbered among the twelve, grant that your church, being delivered from false apostles, may always be guided and governed by faithful and true pastors. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And Father, I pray your Spirit works through me now to faithfully proclaim your truth, and that you give us hearts and ears to hear and receive, and hands and feet to obey. Amen. The path of discipleship in Mark chapter 10 is very challenging as we journey closer to Jerusalem with Jesus. Our text begins with Jesus giving very hard teachings on topics that many of us would probably rather he avoided. In teaching about discipleship, about following him by denying ourselves and carrying our crosses, Jesus here touches on social taboos, untouchable topics such as marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He talks about children and how we should relate to them. He addresses the dangers of our attachment to possessions and wealth, and also our ambitions for greatness. He teaches here about many of the most important aspects of our lives, And how to follow him, we must submit to his teaching in all of these areas. His words for us are hard. 
extreme, very challenging. This is a steep, steep climb to follow Jesus through Mark chapter 10. And because of that, many people in trying to follow Jesus have stumbled over what he says in this chapter. There are many who have stopped following Jesus because of his words on these pages, including one person in the text itself. Jesus' statement two chapters early from Mark 8, that if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and carry their cross and follow me, is fleshed out now in Mark 10. And the implications and applications of his teachings are hard for us to receive. Because the call to follow Jesus affects every aspect of our lives. We know the way of Jesus is hard in part because the disciples following Jesus fail constantly in this chapter to live up to what he's telling them to do. Everything the disciples do in Mark chapter 10 is wrong. Did you notice that? They take a wrong step in every part of the journey. But even though the disciples fail at every step in Mark 10, Jesus does not abandon them. He doesn't reject them. He doesn't give up on them. He stays with them. He keeps teaching them. He keeps leading them. In this chapter, Jesus continues to look after his failing, feeble followers, to correct them, to love them, to bless and heal them, despite their constant missteps. So don't be discouraged if you hear Mark 10 and feel like you are failing at living up to what Jesus teaches here. Maybe as you follow him, you will feel astonished and afraid, just as the disciples did. That's okay. Jesus surrounds himself with people who are failures, with frail followers who misunderstand and don't live up to what he teaches. He comes to bless and serve and save the spiritually bankrupt, the poor in spirit, sinful wretches like us. So as we journey through these somewhat perilous passages, There is a central truth in the middle, which acts as our compass, pointing us toward the truth as we navigate this difficult terrain. And the compass acts as our guide. For the compass is Jesus himself. Verse 32 tells us that as they were following Jesus on the road, going up to Jerusalem, Jesus was walking ahead of them. Our guide through this challenging chapter is Christ himself. He goes before us, leading the way through these hard sections of the journey. He is our guide. And so if we look to him, we will not take a wrong step. In verse 45, Jesus gives us a summary of his life and his mission. He says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life, as a ransom for many. This verse is the central truth of the Christian gospel. This is the core of our good news. It's the key verse of Mark's gospel. If you miss this, you miss everything. This is our compass, our map, leading us in following Jesus. The core of discipleship is understanding who Jesus is and why he came. And Jesus reveals something astounding here. Although he is the Son of Man, revealed in Daniel 7, and therefore given by God glory and power and dominion, that he may be served. The Son of Man comes now to Jerusalem not to be served, but that he may serve and serve in the most ultimate sacrificial way. Here's the guiding principle for us who are journeying with Jesus. The one who sits on heaven's throne with all power and glory and dominion throws it all aside to come and serve others. In the kingdom of God, in order to be great, you must become the servant of all. You must become the slave to the least. And Jesus doesn't just teach this. He lives it. He is journeying to Jerusalem in Mark 10 to lay down his life to serve and save the world. Listen to these words by scholar James Edwards. He writes, 
the preeminent virtue of God's kingdom is not power, it's not freedom, it's service. The preeminence of service in the kingdom of God grows out of Jesus' teaching on love for one's neighbor. For service is love made tangible. The economy of God's kingdom is not based on power or control or wealth or privilege, but on self-sacrifice and giving. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is completely upside down from how our world works. The king of the kingdom of heaven is going to give himself totally away. He will gladly pay with his own life to serve the oppressed and liberate the enslaved so that they can be bought and brought into his kingdom through his sacrifice and service. He lays down his life to pay the ransom for our sin and to buy our freedom to dwell in his kingdom. I read this morning in my devotion, Psalm 49, verse 7, which says, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit, never see hell. The psalmist is saying there's nothing we could pay God to make up for our sin. There's nothing we could do to buy eternal life, to buy life with God forever. And that's true. Jesus knows that. So he comes to lay down his life, the life of the Son of Man, the life of the King of the Kingdom of Heaven, the life of God's own Son, so that he may ransom us by our lives, so that we may dwell with him forever. Jesus tells his disciples in Mark 10, verses 33 and 34, in his most detailed account of what awaits him in Jerusalem, He goes not to be enthroned as the promised Messiah through power and prestige, but through self-sacrifice unto death in order to serve and save sinners. And so this truth that Jesus came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and that we ought to therefore live as servants is the compass that will guide us as we walk through Mark 10. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Know who he is and why he came. Know how he lives and what he willingly goes to do. He has come to serve, not to be served. To willingly lay down his life to save the world. And it's only by following him in service that we can understand the rest of this chapter. Jesus has come to serve. And so if we follow him... We should expect not to be served, but to serve, to be called to serve in every aspect of our lives. The call to service is fleshed out for us by Jesus in four areas of our lives. Service in the context of personal ambition and greatness. Service in the context of our wealth and possessions. Service to children and to the least of society. And lastly, service in our marriages. To follow Jesus, we must approach all these areas looking not to be served, but to serve. So first, serving and personal ambition. Two of Jesus' followers ask Jesus to receive the two top spots for them in his glorious kingdom. They understand Jesus is the Messiah And so they want to secure their own greatness in his kingdom. They're ambitious. Jesus takes the ambition of these disciples and shows them that personal greatness and fulfillment comes not through being given the best seat at the table, not through who you know and how you wield your power and influence, but rather through self-emptying service. The way to greatness is not through personal ambition fulfilled, but through humility and self-emptying sacrifice for the sake of others. The economy of God's kingdom is service. So to be truly great, to obtain greatness in the kingdom of heaven, you must spend your time and energy in serving others, namely the least. Selfish ambition and desire for greatness are at odds with the kingdom that Jesus comes to bring. 
Give yourself away in service. Become a servant, a slave to everyone else. And then you will be great, is what Jesus teaches. This connects to the next aspect of our life that Jesus teaches us on. Service and our wealth and our possessions. Verses 17 to 31 tell the famous story of a rich young ruler coming to Jesus earnestly and asking the most important of questions, the questions most of us would ask if we had the chance. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus lists six commandments from the Ten Commandments, and these six commandments are the ones that instruct God's people how we are to love other people. And the man earnestly says he's kept all of them from childhood. And Jesus looks at this man, and we are told he loved him. That word is agape. It's a word that describes the deepest of loves. It describes God's own love. Jesus looked at this man, and he loved him with God's love. And then he said, one thing you lack. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. The man leaves sorrowful, disheartened by Jesus' words, for he has great possessions. Now, the point of this passage is not to say that if you follow Jesus, no one's allowed to own anything. We have to give away everything you have in order to follow him. That clearly isn't true from countless examples in the Bible of followers of Jesus who owned things, things like houses and other assets. The point Jesus is making is that in order to follow him, nothing, not anything, can be more important to you. This man failed at the first commandment, to love the Lord your God with all and to have no other gods before him, to have no other gods in front of God in terms of your personal priorities. You cannot follow Jesus if there is something else in your life that is more important to you be it money or possessions or family or fame or security or greatness, whatever your God, if it is more important to you than following Jesus, it's not going to work. You must deny yourself to follow him. And this rich young ruler was unwilling to do that. If you have great wealth, it's incredibly hard to follow Jesus faithfully because worldly wealth and possessions have a power to seduce us and steal our hearts away from the Lord. Instead, we must strive to use our wealth and possessions to serve other people. Next, Jesus teaches about serving children. In verse 13, there are people who want Jesus to bless their children, but the disciples see this as inappropriate, and they rebuke them. And Jesus, we're told, is indignant. He is furious toward his disciples. It's a very strong word. This is the only time in the whole Gospels that this word is used to describe how Jesus is feeling. Preventing children from coming to Jesus provoked an anger that was unmatched in the rest of the Gospels. The disciples do not see the significance of serving and loving the least of society. You see, children were an inconvenience in that culture. They had no utility until they reached adulthood. So they were often ignored and devalued as dead weight. But not to Jesus. The kingdom of heaven belongs to children, Jesus teaches. The poor in spirit, the ones who come to Jesus with nothing to bring, they are the ones to whom the kingdom of heaven belongs. They are the very ones he's come to serve. Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Children are our teachers in discipleship. Their faith, their dependence, their reliance are all attributes we should strive to emulate as we follow Jesus. Jesus took the children in his arms, he blessed them, and he laid his hands on them. Go and do likewise. Children do not get in the way of discipleship. They reveal the way of discipleship. We are called to serve the least, and it is in this act of service that we faithfully follow Jesus. Lastly, and most difficult, we come to Jesus' teaching on marriage in verses 1 to 11. 
Many of us probably feel condemned by what Jesus says here about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He presents an ethic that seems for some of us impossible to uphold. So I want to walk slowly through this section so that none of you get left behind. Because what Jesus says here is actually good news for all of us. Verse 1 tells us that Jesus enters the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And this is crucial, or else we miss what's going on. And here's why. Up until now, in Mark's gospel, Jesus has been in the northern region called Galilee, his home region. But now he crosses the river on his way to Jerusalem. He enters a new region, Judea, which is under a different government and jurisdiction. It's like going from B.C. to Alberta. He's crossing a boundary. The king of this region, almost like a governor, a premier, was King Herod, who was married to a divorcee named Herodias. Now, in verse 2 of Mark 10, the Pharisees come to Jesus, we are told, not because they care what he teaches, but because they're trying to test him. And the way they tried to test him was to ask about divorce, knowing that it was a political powder keg. The Pharisees didn't really care what Jesus taught about divorce. They were trying to use the topic to trap him and to get him into trouble with the local governor, King Herod who has married a woman who was formerly his brother's wife. In Mark 6, we're told that John the Baptist condemns Herod's marriage to this new wife, Herodias, claiming that the union is unlawful because Herodias was the former wife of his brother, Philip. So he's taking his brother's wife as his own. And John the Baptist condemns him and says, no, this is unlawful. You can't do this. John condemns that specific marriage, suggesting Herodias and Philip's divorce is illegitimate. And therefore, Herod's marriage is a sham, and he's committing adultery with his brother's wife. You probably know Herod's response to John's condemnation is to arrest John and then to execute him. Now, this is a very well-known contemporary scandal, and the Pharisees know that Jesus is John the Baptist's cousin, and he loved John. So the Pharisees, knowing what happened to John, are now trying to trap Jesus into condemning Herod, just like John did, in hopes that Herod will now arrest Jesus and maybe even kill him, like he did John. So, but Jesus does not take the bait at all. Instead of taking sides in a political scandal and the religious dogma around divorce, he instead teaches about marriage. You see, the Pharisees, the religious elites, want to know how close can we go to sin before it's called sin? How far can we go to the boundary? What is allowed? What's the most, 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 most extreme thing? Jesus isn't interested in that discussion. He wants to focus on the goodness of marriage, on the gift of marriage, rather than how far you can transgress till you're allowed to get out of it. Jesus quotes Genesis 1 and 2 to show the intended permanence of marriage. He shows how human sexuality is a divine creation. God made them male and female. And how human marriage is therefore a divine ordinance. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And then Jesus adds his own teaching, his own interpretation in verse 8. So therefore, they are no longer two, but one. And what therefore God has joined together, let humans not separate. Marriage is a divine creation, which includes a supernatural covenant and a coming together of two persons to become one flesh that cannot be undone. It is not merely a human civil contract that we can rip up whenever it becomes inconvenient. Marriage, according to scripture, is God-ordained, exclusive, a lifelong covenant vow defined by mutual support and self-sacrifice to serve the other partner. Only after this truth is established does Jesus deal with the issue of divorce. So Jesus focuses on marriage. He defines marriage by what scripture says of it. And only after we understand marriage can we then understand divorce. Divorce is a concession to human sinfulness. It is not a command, as the Pharisees suggest, but it's a permission due to human frailty rather than divine intention. 
Pastor John Stott writes that God, Jesus is not indicating God's approval of divorce, but rather prevents divorce as a concession to limit the potential of evil. God concedes that his perfect intention in creating marriage has been corrupted by human sin. So he permits the potential for a marriage to be ended. This is what Deuteronomy 24 is all about, which is what the Pharisees quote in verse 4. So divorce is permissible in very specific circumstances, according to Scripture. It's a concession, a reluctant concession, because of human sin in the context of marriage. But with that in mind, we need to now ask what Jesus means when he teaches about remarriage in verses 11 and 12. Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This seems to suggest at face value that no remarriages are ever valid in Jesus' eyes. And for many of us who have been remarried or divorced or love people who have, these verses seem to condemn us and our relationships and seem impossible for us to believe. So what do we do with this? When in scripture you come to a difficult passage where you think to yourself, this can't possibly mean what it seems to be saying. What do we do? Well, the first thing you must do is what Jesus does in verse 3 and again in verse 6. You must let scripture interpret scripture. So if you come to a hard issue where you don't know what the passage is talking about, look for other verses that speak on the same topic and look for complementarity and synthesis. You see, if the entire book of the Bible is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, then it can't contradict itself. If this entire book is God's word, God's voice for us, then he can't say one thing somewhere and then the opposite somewhere else. So we need to interpret Mark 10 verses 11 and 12 in light of all of scripture to understand what it means and therefore what it cannot mean. And what you will see if you study all the other texts on divorce and remarriage in scripture is that in some cases, remarriage is permissible. So we can't just simply conclude at face value that any remarriage is wrong based only on this single verse because there are other verses in the Bible that teach the exact opposite. I just want to look at three of them. The first is in Deuteronomy 24, the very verse that Jesus first appeals to, where remarriage is offered as permissible. And it seems more than permissible, it's expected in Deuteronomy 24, following a divorce. More importantly, in Matthew 19, it's the same story as Mark chapter 10. And notice what Matthew's account includes, which is absent from Mark. Matthew 19, verse 9, Jesus says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Jesus in Matthew gives an exception, whereby remarriage is allowed. He teaches that if your spouse is sexually immoral against you, if they are unfaithful, then you are free to divorce and marry another. In the ancient world where Jesus lived, every known culture, pagan, Jewish, all of them, accepted that divorce and remarriage was permissible on the grounds of sexual immorality. It was assumed, it was ubiquitous, it was universal. Everyone felt this way without any known exceptions. It was universally held that, of course, you could remarry if your spouse was unfaithful to you. So it was redundant to list this as an exception. And that's why Mark can leave it out. It's assumed, it's known, it's understood. One other passage that deals with divorce and remarriage is in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15, where Paul is writing to Christians about what they should do if their unbelieving spouse leaves them deserts them. And Paul writes that the Christian partner should let it be so. In that case, the brother or sister, that is the believing spouse, is not enslaved, is no longer bound to their marriage. So later in scripture, after Jesus, there's another exception that's added. If your unbelieving spouse leaves you, you are released from your marriage with them. 
So if we now look at the whole counsel of Scripture, we can see that Jesus taught that divorce on the grounds of sexual immorality is allowed. But we shouldn't therefore concede that Jesus is encouraging divorce. He obviously isn't. Jesus' emphasis is on the permanence of marriage in God's purposes and God's plan. Sometimes human sin, in various forms, breaks the bonds of marriage irreparably. Some of us are victims of that breaking. Some of us are perpetrators. And in those cases, due to human failure and sin, divorce and remarriage can be permissible. But that does not mean that we should not still hold a very high view of marriage and seek to see marriages last. For the Christian following Jesus, marriage is a high calling. It is a covenant between two parties before God and man, whereby you are committing to give your life to serve the other. It's not just a human contract. It's a divinely sanctioned covenant. It is a divine creation. In very particular circumstances, the Bible does permit divorce. But instead of focusing on the loopholes and how to get out of marriage, we should be more interested in building healthy marriages that will heal and where hurt parties can reconcile, other than looking for loopholes to allow lax marriage contracts. In Mark 10, Jesus calls us to follow him and then tells us his primary principle. He has come to serve, not to be served, and to give his life to save and serve many. This is the way of greatness. This is the way of Jesus. This is the proper way to steward our wealth and our possessions. This is the posture of service and how we should relate to children and the least to society. And this is how we should approach marriage. We should embrace a servant posture in how we love and live to serve our spouse. The chapter ends with a picture that exemplifies this teaching. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus cries out for Jesus to restore his sight. And Jesus stops to serve the lowly member of society. Bartimaeus joyfully then joins the disciples in journeying with Jesus, following him up the steep, dangerous road ahead that leads to Jerusalem, to the cross, to Jesus' resurrection, and then to his eternal, glorious reign. So let's go with him. Amen. Please pause this video and listen to the song below in the box below or on the link if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. It's an old hymn written in 1918, the middle of a pandemic at the end of World War I, that's called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I encourage you to listen to it, to sing it, to contemplatively, prayerfully think about the lyrics as we think about following Jesus. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us, and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness, and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Together we say the Collect for the second Sunday of Lent. 
Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault the, and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In a few hours we will have our annual general meeting, and so would you pray this prayer with me for our church. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in our annual general meeting for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right, and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. We pray together. Increase, O God, the spirit of neighborliness among us, that in peril we may uphold one another, in suffering tend to one another, and in homelessness, sickness, loneliness, or exile, befriend one another. Grant us brave and enduring hearts that we may strengthen one another until the disciplines and testing of these days are ended and you again give peace in our time. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.